uh, have a proper posture because we're not just talking about someone who are distant from us. In fact, He is our God and He is right there with us. Okay, so we're not just talking about someone that exists afar away from us, but someone whom we uh, build our life upon and He's our God. Okay, so I want to continue to remind you, okay, we're uh, talking about God, and we're not talking about 10 different uh, persons, but we're talking about one person with all these attributes. Today, um, we want to talk about something called omnipotence of God, omnipotent. The word literally means omni, all potence, uh, potency of uh, medicine, drug, power. So the word literally means all-powerful. Can you think with me? If God is not powerful, how can he be God of the universe and be the sovereign and claim to be, uh, through his providence, he is guiding, leading, and controlling and governing the history. How can, how can they be possible? It's not, right? So omnipotence is his inherent uh, nature, power, okay? Which refers to having infinite and unlimited power within God, uh, within from, him, uh, from God himself. You know this verse? Uh, scripture says God is mighty, to save. He's powerful to save. Can you imagine God is not powerful enough to overcome his enemy? Then how can he save, right? Bible claims that he's mighty to save from Satan, from sin, from the enemies, and from the slavery of sin. In fact, all things. So when we speak of God's attribute, it means he can do all that he has determined to do, and no person nor force can hinder him or force him to do contrary. Let me repeat that, okay, because it's kind of like an important working definition. When we say omnipotence of God with regards to God, he can do all that he has determined to do. I'll explain that, okay? And no person, no force can hinder him or force him to do the contrary. The reason what he determined to do is because when we say God can do all things, it means that he can do all that is in agreement with his nature or who he is. Now think with me. All things uh, that is in agreement to his holiness his righteousness, and his love, and his justice, not contrary to those natures. Do you remember the important theology is all the attributes of God exist in perfect harmony. It's a very important thing to understand that he is justice, God of justice, at the same time, God of love, God of love. He is God of wrath, and God of kindness and mercy, okay? Perfect harmony. So in other words, he cannot contradict himself nor his nature. For example, he cannot be unrighteous and be evil and bad. He can't do that. That's not possible. He cannot be untruthful and lie. Yeah, when we say all things are possible, it doesn't mean he could lie. Okay? He cannot be unfaithful and make or break uh, promises. And he cannot be unloving and be cruel and selfish. And etc. So on and so on, right? Also, he cannot be absurd, absurd and be illogical. What do you mean by that? He cannot make square circle. It cannot be square and a circle at the same time. That's illogical. That's absurd. Absurd. 
triangle with four corners. That's just illogical. Or rocks that is so heavy that he cannot move them. Okay, so omnipotence doesn't mean he can sin, lie, cruel, be cruel and evil, which is contrary to his nature, and not being himself. And he cannot break his promises, and unfaithful, unrighteous, and unloving. But rather, it means he can do all that he has determined to do as the sovereign God and sovereign king who governs. Remember, everything is coming together now. He is sovereign. He's the king of the nature and history and nations. And he governs, which means he is the God of providence. Towards what? Towards his end, his purpose, with absolute certainty. How does he do that? With his omnipotent power, okay? To his teleologic end. The word teleo means the end, right? God has that teleologic purpose in his mind. Wouldn't it be good to know that? In fact, we do know that. What is the teleologic purpose of his predetermined purpose in history? You know, we've been going over this again and again and again. You know what it is? It is to save his people in Jesus for the glory of his name. That's it. It's not so much about your studies. It is not about your marriage. It is not about your abundance in this side of eternity. It is not even about your health. All those things, of course, God guides and provides and protects. But it is not about that. The end of all things is his glorious name. And how does he do that? Through the saving of his people through Jesus Christ. So omnipotence is moving toward that purpose, okay? Now, I, I know I asked this question in the beginning, but can God, who is not omnipotent, mighty to save? If he's weak, can he save? You see? He's the sovereign. How could the sovereign who claims the providence, who proclaims the gov governance, who claims the provision, and who is weak. You see, Bible clearly states that he is the mighty God, mighty to save. Okay, that's who he is. Here are some names of God or the titles of God that you uh, may heard of, which reveal his nature and character of omnipotence, his power. Okay, Genesis 17, 1 says, his name is God Almighty. Oh, by the way, the word almighty and omnipotence is similar, but I think almighty embraces a little bit more than omnipotence. It also embraces omnipresence and omniscient. There are three omni uh, words, characters, or attributes of God. One is omnipotence, that's, we are, that, that's what we are talking about today. And omnipresent, which means he's everywhere. He's in your room right now. He's in your heart. He's everywhere as a full person, not divided, but full person. And we will be talking about another omni word, omniscient. He knows all things. He knows every man and what is in a man. So almighty embraces a little bit more than omnipotence. So his name is God Almighty. Revelation 4 a says, the Lord God Almighty. Okay? We sing that song, right? And Revelation 19, 6 says, God the Almighty. And Psalm 24, 8 says, the Lord strong and mighty. Psalm 31, verse 2 says, a rock of strength. Psalm 61, 3 says, a tower of strength. Isaiah 9, 6 says, Mighty God. That's Jesus, isn't it? Mighty God. Isaiah ch chapter 9. Luke chapter 1, verse 49 says, 
the mighty one, mighty one. Okay, so is there anything that is beyond the power of God? Okay, anything that he cannot do? And what does Bible say about that? Just a couple of places, one, in, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, if you who have made the heaven and the earth by your great power, by your outstretched arms, nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too hard for you. Behold, verse 27, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Now, I want you to remember that expression because we're going to see that on Sunday when we talk about uh, Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17. God of all flesh, which means he has the authority of all mankind. Your life, mine. Okay? And then he rhetorically asks, is anything too hard for me? What does the Bible say? He is omnipotent. Okay? And when we come to the New Testament, Jesus affirms and that omnipotence of God. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Very inter interesting story that we could all relate. Jesus said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, can you think with me? With men, it is impossible, but all things are possible with God. Isn't that great to know? Right? And what is the story about? The story is about this rich, young ruler. Remember that story? It's a, one of the favorite stories of the Gospels. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Very interesting story. This young man who is rich. Imagine a young, rich person. Do you know anybody who's rich and young? Very rare, right? And he is young, healthy. He has the youth and also ruler or successful, sort of like a congressman. So if you put those three together, he basically had everything all humanity is seeking after. Richness, health, and success. Is that what you're seeking? But this rich, young ruler came to Jesus really seeking for one thing. You know what that was? What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's about salvation. Salvation. Okay? Remember, Jesus answered him lovingly. Because he loved him, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasures in heaven. And then come and follow me. Jesus meant it. Jesus loved this young person. But do you remember the story he just heard what Jesus said, and he walked away sad because of his great riches. And then this is what Jesus said, truly, truly I say to you, how difficult is it for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven? A couple of weeks ago, we've been talking about money and possession. Bible continues to, and Jesus continues to warn the people, Right? How difficult is it for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And then he gives this comparison illustration. It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle. Is that possible? That's impossible. Then for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Wow, people who were hearing this, disciples, were, they were astonished. And then they were basically kind of like, oh, then who can then be saved? Who could possibly be saved? That's the context. And to that poignant question, Jesus said, with men, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Omnipotence of God, Right? All things are possible with regards to his teleological purpose of saving his people. Okay? In other words, salvation of men, rich or poor, is impossible. But with God, omnipotence of God, 
it is possible. Okay? So, now when we talk about omnipotence of God in the Bible, it's the one attribute that distinguishes him from all the other false gods or idols. In the Bible, there are a lot of idols, right? Baal, Asherah, and all kinds of idols. And we have idols. And what separates, what distinguishes true God, one true God, and false God and idol is the omnipotence of God. Would you reason with me? If there are many gods in this world and in existence, and they're compatible, they're fighting, then can God claim that he's the sovereign? How can he possibly save you then? It doesn't make any sense at all, does it? So one attribute that distinguishes God from all the other is the omnipotence. There is none like him. Psalm 115 kind of explains it this way. Our God is, uh, is in the heavens, and he does all that he pleases. Okay, that's just the way it is because he is sovereign, right? Uh, their idols, however, the idols are silver and gold and the work of human hands. In other words, we human beings created idols. And this is how we handle these idols. They have mouth but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. They have noses, but they do not smell. All these idols. They have hands, but they do not feel. They have feet, and they do not walk. They have throats, but they do not make any sound. And those who make them become like them. If you have idols that you create, you become like them. I was thinking about this. Remember Jesus said God cannot serve God and money? If you love money, worship money, that's your idol. That's your A God, small g-o-d. And Bible says if you make them, you will be like them. And that's generally the truth. If you Love Christ, if he's your God, you will become like him. But if you worship idol, and if you make the idols, and you will become like them. But all these idols are man-made, and they are powerless. What distinguishes the true, one true God from all the others is the power of God. Power of God. And I love this story. Let me tell you a story. Uh, in the Bible, 1 King chapter 18, the story of Elijah, okay, with 850 prophets of Ahab, Ahab 450 Baal uh, prophets, and 400 prophets of Eshra, these idol-worshipping false prophets, 850 of them versus just one prophet of God at the mountain of Carmel. Remember that? That, that amazing confrontation. So they met at the mountain of Carmel, and this is what Elijah suggested to, to figure out who is the true God, okay? Let there be two bulls, bring out two bulls, and cut them in pieces, and lay it on wood and the altar, but put no fire to it. Can you picture that? Two altars, two bulls, cut in pieces for the burnt offering, and there is wood prepared, altar prepared, but there is no fire. He has suggested that let's call on the name of your God or my God. And whoever answers by fire is the true God. Remember that story? One true prophet of, uh, of, of Yahweh. His name is Elijah versus 850 crazy false prophets. Okay? So... It was the, uh, the prophets of Eshra and Baal, they, they went first, okay? So, starting from the morning, they call on the name of Baal and Eshra, their idol, their own god. Oh, Baal, answer us. No voice, no answer. 
And they were dancing, they were screaming, they were limping, they were doing everything all throughout the morning. By the time it reaches the lunchtime, Elijah finally speaks up at noon, and he's taunting them. Listen to this. Elijah really trash talks. Listen to this, okay? Cry out loud, for he is your God. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself. I was like cracking up. What? That's real trash talk, isn't it? Your God is relieving himself right now. He's in the bathroom. Okay? He's on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping and must be, must be awakened. Cry out louder. Cry out louder. Elijah just kind of trash talks, talks to them. Right? And so they began to cry out even louder, cut themselves with sword and lances until Blood was, blood was gushing out of their bodies. Can you picture that? But no fire. There's no power. No voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. There is no, uh, there is no, uh, there, uh, there is no false gods. I mean, uh, fo- uh, those are the false gods. Okay? So it was Elijah's turn in the afternoon. Okay? And this is what he did. This is so fascinating if you could if you could listen to this. He told, everybody come close. Everybody come close. Okay? And there is the altar with the wood and with a bull cut into pieces. And this is what he told people to do. Make a trench around the altar. Trench. Okay? Dig up and make a trench around the altar. Okay? And put the wood and put the bull on top of it. Cut the bull in pieces and put the, and, and, and the meat on top, of, uh, on top of the wood. And then, crazily, this is what Elijah said. Go get four jars of water, four jars, and pour it on the burnt offering. And the meat, as well as the wood, and just soak it up. Okay? Four jars, large jars. And then, he does even crazier things. Do it one more time. Four more jars. And then he does one more time. One more time. Just soak it, wet it, pour it upon this uh, altar until the water began to uh, spill down to the trenches. Can you picture that? Now he's going to call on the name of the Lord for the fire, which is an impossibility. Okay? Verse 36, Elijah prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of, God of Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant. I have done all these things at your word. Now answer me, O Lord, that this people may know that you, Lord, are true God, that you have turned their hearts towards you. So he began to pray. What happened? Then the fire of the Lord came upon the altar, consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up all the water from the trenches itself. Can you picture that? Isn't that amazing? And all the people saw this, and they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Elijah ordered to seize the prophets of Baal. Every single one of them, kill them, seize them. Right? One attribute that distinguishes idols, false gods, from the true God is the power of God. It's the omnipotence of God. In the New Testament, let's look at the power of Jesus. Same nature. Now, this is amazing. I was meditating about this. Philippians chapter 2 says, Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God. In other words, Jesus is omnipotent. But he did not consider equal with God, but he emptied himself, and he became a man. And then he humbled himself even more and be obedient 
and obedient to death. Remember that story? So, how powerful is Jesus, the power of Jesus or the Son of God? In fact, he's the Yahweh in person, in flesh, incarnated in humility as the Son of God. Okay? So when we say Jesus, the Son of God, who is the Lord, and he came into history in our flesh, and he displayed power, remember? He was no, no ordinary person. So I want us to think of Jesus' power in three different stages, okay? First, 33 years before the death and resurrection. Second, after the resurrection. Third, when he finally comes as the judge of the living and the dead. Can we think about that? So first, first 33 years, he started as an infant. The word became flesh as an infant. Can you even imagine that? Omnipotent God, mighty God, as an infant, right? First 33 years, and then after his death and resurrection, and then until, uh, and then when he comes in glory. Okay, so let's look at his earthly ministry, 33 years. What kind of power did he have? He had power to heal. Power to heal all kinds of sicknesses. All kinds of demon possession. Power to heal all kinds of, uh, all kinds of like sicknesses. He had power to cast out demons. So he had authority over supernatural beings, right? And he had power to perform miracles, opening of the blind eyes, someone who was born with blind eyes. He had power to feed 5,000 people with small lunch bag. He had power to perform all kinds of miracles. Not only that, he had power to Raise the dead. Three times at least we see that. Lazarus, right? He raised the dead, which is a prerogative of God himself. Who could raise the dead? Only God can, right? He had power to raise the dead. What else did he have power over? He has power over nature. Remember he calmed the storms? Remember he walked on water in raging storms? He had power of nature. Not only that, he knew all men, omniscience. He knew all men, and he knew what is in a man. We're talking about the power of Jesus. Matthew chapter 26, verse 53 says, The power of heaven uh, at his hand. People were trying to arrest him and kill him, and uh, disciples were asking, Why don't you ask the like, power from heaven? But he just resisted. The power of heavens are at his command. Jesus was a powerful person. Secondly, after the resurrection, okay, on top of everything that we described, after the resurrection, what happened to how how powerful was he, or how, how uh, what what happened to him? Matthew chapter twenty-eight, verse eighteen says, "All authority." in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Okay? And then verse 20 says, Behold, I am with you always until the end of the ages. That sounds like now Jesus is omnipresent after the resurrection. On top of everything that we talked about, uh, uh, you know, the power that he had before uh, the death and resurrection. Now, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Power over your life. Power of all flesh. All authority. All nations. Remember we talked about this? He has power over United States of America. Who's going to be the president? He raises the king, and he humbles the king. He raises the president, and he humbles the presidents. Okay? Philippians chapter 1, 
It's an amazing verse, remember? Who being in very nature God, omnipotent God, but he did not consider equal with God, but he emptied himself. He did not not become a God. He was God, he is God, but he did not exercise those prerogatives and power on his own ends. But he emptied himself and he humbled himself. And he was obedient to death, death on a cross. Now, do you see what's happening here? Omni, omnipotent, omnipotent God all the way to the cross. Okay, all the way to the cross. What happened? Therefore, God exalted him, the Bible says. Okay, therefore, God exalted him, the name that is above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So that Jesus is the Lord, and the, every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. That's how powerful he is. Okay. Finally, when he returns as the judge and the consummator of history, how powerful is he? He is the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. On top of everything that we described the last few minutes, now he's going to come to judge the living and the dead. Mark chapter 13, 26 says, he will come clothed with full power and the glory of God. He is the true God. He's the true God. Omnipotent God. I just want to uh, connect everything together with the gospel. You know, we always try to do that. We talked about the attribute of omnipotence of God, and we talked about the power of Jesus. Now, how do we connect the two? What is the gospel? I want to read a couple of places. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. Do you hear it? For salvation. What is the power of God? It is the gospel. It is the gospel. It is the gospel that is the power of God for salvation. Salvation for whom? To everyone who believes. First to the Jews and for the Gentiles. In other words, to entire humanity. Okay? What is Paul saying here? What is the scripture saying here? The gospel is the power of God. Can I just ask you, do you have the gospel in your life? Right? And it is, it is the power of God for salvation, which we establish is an impossibility for men. And how can anyone be saved? How can anybody's heart be changed? It is only through the power of God. No one can change your heart. No one can free you from the slavery of Satan and sin? How could anyone make you believe? No one can do that. Even the most eloquent preacher is the most powerful preacher. It doesn't really matter. Only God can. Okay? It's the power of God. And it is available to all men, and that is the gospel and gospel of, uh, of Jesus Christ. The second place I want to introduce is 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 18, very, very famous passage. For the message or the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The message of the cross. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Do you hear it, people? The message of the cross is the gospel, and that is the power of God. Verse 22, Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who is Christ? Isn't he the Yahweh with all power? Isn't he the omnipotent God, sovereign, 
Yes, he is. But Christ crucified. That's the gospel. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You know what? Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1.18 is saying the gospel is the message of the cross. That's the power of God. It is not the relevance. It is not the eloquence. It is not even the theological statements. It's the message of the cross. Who is Christ? He's the omnipotent God. Yahweh sovereign. Almighty God. Right? He is mighty to save. How did he do that? By being crucified. In other words, he was willing to go to the cross as a helpless lamb. Can you imagine? Powerful God, helpless lamb. Right? Who obeyed so that he will go to the Calvary and to be slaughtered. You know, I think about this statement. He became weak so that you may be strong. Are you strong? He became weak so that we may be strong in Christ. You know, I think about, you know, my feeble heart. Do you find yourself pretty sturdy, stable, steadfast? Or do you find yourself fickle and weak and just like floating around a lot? Christ became weak so that we may become strong. 2 Corinthians 13, 4 says, For he was crucified in weakness. And I think that's an amazing statement. But he lives, he was raised by the power of God. All right, let me, let me just sum it up. That's the gospel message. And that's the power of God. He's mighty to save. Okay, he's mighty to save. To save the impossible sinners like you. How did he do that? Christ crucified. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ alone. God uses it's the foolishness of preaching, just pro proclaiming Christ crucified to save the sick, save the lost. That's the power of God. Okay? My brothers and sisters, may we put our absolute confidence and trust in Him. He is the omnipotent God who humbled Himself and became weak so that you and I may become strong in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we uh, want to bless you and thank you. What a wonderful night. And what an amazing God you are. God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, almighty God. Very being in, being in nature, God, who humbled himself. And he, and you, you were obedient to death, death on a cross, so that we may become your children, O Lord. And Bible clearly says that is the power of God, and it is the gospel of Jesus Christ crucified. And pray that we will continue to cherish it, treasure it, and continue to proclaim it, Lord God. Holy Spirit, would you move today so that our hearts may be turned to you, Lord. Holy Spirit, would you draw your people to yourself, Lord. And we just commit this evening unto you, and we bless you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining today.